And I know what's going to happen because I know we're going to start answering these and then you're going to have questions based on what we're answer asking here. But I want to make sure everybody's question gets answered. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll do our best to, to, to hit this all. We have a wonderful person um, through the web. And hello, we're so happy that you joined us that has asked a question. And um, I, I'm hoping someone told her that the soda pop was great because she was curious about that too. Um, and um, so her, I'm, they, he was real nice to give me a summary of it, but I think, I think her question is really important. Or his question, I'm sorry, I don't know. Can't tell your gender. Um, mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like, how do you know which diet based on what symptom of your child to follow? Because, you know, there's all these different ones that we talked about, and there's GFCF, SCD, and then all the different pieces. And are there symptoms in a child that you can look for to know which diet is best for them? So I think, I think all of us probably would have an opinion. Julie, you want to start with that? Sure. It's a great question because it's the thing I probably spend most of my time in my practice determining is what diet somebody needs as well as what maybe combination of diets somebody mm -hmm. needs. And to answer which diet to do is the hard part. I would say that in general, people often will start with gluten and casein free first and then go to the specific carbohydrate diet if they need it and then often incorporate other principles, whether it's fermented foods or body ecology diet principles or low oxalate principles, phenol principles, you know, which one to do would be depending on which symptoms somebody had. And so, you know, um, actually, on Friday, I'm going to be going a lot more into each of the diets and some of the symptoms each of them typically present and some things to look out for as well as some things that benefit each of them because that's probably a 15-minute discussion at least. And so I don't know if I could answer specifically the answer. I would say that it kind of goes along with one of the questions here is what if my daughter likes a little bit of food with her ketchup? That would be the perfect a uh, example of how I would determine where to start. So if there's someone really mm -hmm. obsessed with a food, doesn't want to eat anything mm -hmm. except for that food, I'd mm -hmm. start there. And so in the case of the ketchup answer, I would say I would consider tomatoes an issue, and I would consider phenols because tomatoes are phenols, or I would look at the nightshades. Or, so sometimes that is a good way to go. If you can make a correlation to a particular food, you might be able to work backwards and figure out what their, where their challenge is. I mean, that's kind of to start. Yeah. I'm, so, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that, that, that's what I was going to say. Uh, the comment that I'd like to make, based on research, I know the gluten and, and, and casein-free diet does show a great result fairly quickly, but, but even more than whether it's GFCF, or SCD, the first diet that I would start would be a healthy diet, a balanced nutritional approach. Make sure you're balancing your protein, carbs, and fats, getting good sources of protein, non-GMO uh, produce and things like that. So whatever diet you, you do, the most important aspect of that, in my opinion, is that you have a balanced nutritional diet that's a great point. Mm -hmm. And the, the last thing I want to say, one other thing, we, we've talked about the corn on and off today. If I have a child that is having really strong aggression, we have seen a big pattern of this over the last five years in our clinic, that the kids that are really aggressive, frequently corn is one of the triggers of that. So if you have a child that's very aggressive, just try removing corn for a week. You'll know probably in just a couple of days if corn is a factor, but that can be a big reason for aggression. Digestive problems, take them off of soy. Um, you know, uh, uh, there's so many different other areas, but we've got a lot of questions. Can, can I just follow up on that? So if corn is an issue, do you mean corn is an issue because they have gut bacteria? Do you mean corn is an issue because there's a yeast or it is a corn intolerance? It could be a combination. Corn intolerance is actually not, doesn't tend to be as big on the IgG that we have right. seen. But there is the brain allergy component okay. because our, our brains will build antibodies to certain foods and there's, especially we've seen a big subset in the clinic of kids in more the young teenage range that are, that corn will make very, very aggressive. Um, a lot of things were in you know, you're going to be learning a lot about it, vaccines over the next couple of days. And a lot of things have been in our vaccines that have caused a lot of problems and we don't know where they came from. AIDS being one of the biggest one. I mean, it's certainly one of my theories, as is Lisa Lewis's and a lot of us who have been doing this for a while, that, that is the fact that AIDS um, 
that so many of these kids are allergic to eggs is because so many of our vaccines were cultivated on eggs. And that was the first immune response that we had. So there's other things to think about. Um, but but uh, and, 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 and some things too, you know, gluten and casein, for the most part, and actually maybe we should segue into that next question, because gluten and casein, for the most part, needs to be 100%. I mean, if, it's a, if you're dealing with the opioid effect, it's an addiction, and you can't kind of take away an addiction. It just doesn't, it doesn't really work. But when, you, when we're talking about lowering corn, you know, maybe you can do corn starch, but you just can't do Fritos. You know, maybe you can do um, soy lecithin, but you can't do uh, soy isolate protein. So there's different components to the to those foods as well. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to bring that enzyme? Because that enzyme question is. Oh a yes, there was a question on can I do enzymes? Uh, well, I don't rem I don't have the exact question here, but I can just answer the enzyme question, and that's always a big one. Is you know, can I do, do? How do you feel about using enzymes instead of special diets? I would say that, like Betsy said, it, enzymes, I do not believe, fix a problem with a food. They can sometimes help break it down or help have a little bit less of a reaction. Maybe if there's some cross-contamination from and, some and gluten. Spe specify the enzymes that you're speaking of, oh, not so necessarily spe all digestive right. enzymes. So I'm speaking of things like DPP-4 or those things that might break down the opiates for gluten or casein, or even just a broad spectrum enzyme that might have some good things to help break down whatever other, ever, whatever other fats, carbs, or proteins might not be fully being broken down, which might just be creating the digestive problem or, or whatever it might be. But specific, specifically, the question is usually regarding, can I do enzymes instead of a gluten casein-free diet? That's right. usually the question. And I would say, usually, I don't find that that works. It usually needs to be a combination of diet and the enzymes. With that said, sometimes I've had people that, for whatever reason, it took them a little while to get all of the foods out. And so they might start enzymes while they're waiting to do that. But Betsy and I were talking, and one of the concerns with answering this question saying, yeah, you can do the diet 80% and then you can take enzymes, is that it opens up, firstly, it's not true for many people. And we, we want to start with 100% of the diet and see how they do, and then see if you can incorporate mm -hmm. a few of the foods with, mm -hmm. foods with a few enzymes and see how that compares. And then it's like the whole world of gray. If, if you've ever given up sugar or something, it's so much easier if you just say, I'm not eating any sugar. Then if it's like, can I have this sugar? Ooh, I, I, maybe I want that brownie. It's like the whole world, it makes it challenging. So we feel a little concerned to just say, yeah, use enzymes instead. But yes, sometimes enzymes are helpful as you're working in conjunction with diet. That's I fine. think it becomes very difficult to a child to, if you do too much gray. You know, it's so much easier for them to understand black and white because otherwise you're going to have so much begging, but please, you let me have it last week. Why won't you let me have it today? It's so much better if you can say, no, these are the rules. These are the way the rules are going to be. So we have another question from the web. When making butternut fries, can we pre-cut and freeze the fries, or you, do we need to parboil them? And, and I would say that you could cut them and freeze them and then take them out. That's, that's my belief on using those. I, it might be something that you could cut and freeze, excuse me, cut and cook and then freeze after they're cooked, which would be a little easier than for the reheating process. But, but either way, it wouldn't hurt the the butternut fries. I have one more. I guess I have to follow up because I, I've been waiting for this question. And I'm, um, <laughs> those of you who've been eating lunch at the, um, at the benchmark restaurant, there's a question. There was a great roll that is GFCF in the restaurant. Does anyone have the recipe? Boy, do I wish I had the recipe. But I'll tell you about those, those rolls. <laughs> um, a friend of Betsy's has a brand new bakery that is called Bristol Baking. And they are going to be open very soon, if they're not already. And here's the great part about this. I work with the hotel to make sure that, that we have great gluten and dairy-free meals during the conference. And Betsy had introduced me via mail and telephone and internet to her friend that has this Bristow Bakery. And so she wanted me to see if I could introduce them to the hotel. And in order to do that, she felt inclined to send me samples of these rolls. <laughs> Poor Susan. I am telling you, I was so excited when I had this roll. 
it, and I don't want to share it with anybody. You know, usually at my house, my husband doesn't have any choice. Everything is GFC if, except for these rolls. There's no way I was going to share them because they were that good. Um, Susan Bear yes. is going to be at my booth as soon as the booth opens up. I think that's Friday, sampling these buns and talking about her bakery. And they will be available throughout the conference as long as the supply lasts. So you can have a GFCF burger on a bun that is like nothing you've ever had before. Now, we want to make sure and, and, and say, because people will look at the ingredients and say, but it's got corn in it. It's got, you know. Um, a, a, it doesn't have soy. soy. No soy. But the, the, the thing is, is that, no, nutritionally, it's not like the greatest thing you could eat. But if you can get your child to eat a turkey sandwich with sprouts and um, all kinds of, you know, and, or to, to eat a, a hamburger because of this bun, it's okay that it's somewhat dead nutrition because you're getting so much nutrition from what you can potentially put between it. <laughs> Very good. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, any advice on implementing um, the diet for my five-year-old son prefers liquids over solids mm -hmm. with the exception of Terra chips. Um, I see this a lot uh, with texture sensitivities and um, especially they, they just, basically I've seen five, six-year-olds do nothing but drink out of a sippy cup everything that they eat and where parents need to puree everything into it and um, so I, I don't know which extreme that you're, you're dealing with here but this is something that's that is more common than not um, it, this is something you want to work with your speech therapist on. You need to find a speech therapist who's trained in oral motor sensitivity because there's a whole piece of the suck, swallow, and, and they have to learn how to be able to suck through a straw and they need to be able to learn how to swallow properly and they have to be able to blow and that those th pieces will help all strengthen all the muscles in their mouth. And then, in a, but people will say to me, but my child can't eat a piece of meat. If they can chew a Terra chip, they can chew a piece of meat. It goes back to that texture fear like we talked about with the worms. So you have to do it very, very slowly in introducing these textures. If the child's belly is full with liquids all the time, they are not going to be open to trying other foods. Okay. How do you know when your gut is healed so you can reintroduce nuts if you are allergic? I would say if you have a, a true nut allergy, I would not introduce nuts no matter how healed your gut is. That is an IgE response or an anaphylactic response and no amount of healing the gut is typically going to fix or help that. So I would say from that perspective, I wouldn't do that. However, to answer the question a little more broadly, if they're sensitive to a food and not truly allergic, then you can go ahead sometimes and introduce some of these. So it depends what the food is. How do you know when the gut is healed? That's always a little bit difficult of a question. There are some gut permeability tests that your doctor could run or some other things that you could look at quantitatively and see how the bacteria count is doing and if the, how the yeast is doing and all of that, or some stool tests. But really, one of the best ways is just have their digestive symptoms disappeared and are, is there, are their bowel movements regulated and are they doing pretty well? And, so I would say that those are going to be some of your best ways to see is how is the child doing if their digestive function is now really great and their elimination is great and they're doing really well in school, you could probably try to do a few of these introductions or some foods that they might have been a little sensitive to in the past and uh, just introduce a small amount of that food maybe for breakfast and lunch and, and then do a three-day wait. So if you introduce it on Monday, then wait Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, see if you notice any reaction to it, keep a diet record, and see if they seem to be able to tolerate it okay. And then you may be able to introduce it on a rotation basis or something like that. I probably would avoid if you go from a really leaky gut to just, oh, they seem to be fine the one time I added it and added in the diet every day because you don't want to create that sensitivity again. So if you do, I would tread lightly and go slowly. So if any, if on any of the diets, especially the GFC, if you go off the diet for a day or a week, will your health be compromised and what happens when you start the diet again? There, there's a couple of reasons why I think that that's not a good idea to go off the diet. Um, and I approach things from a different point of view because I do have celiac disease, which is just a little bit different. And one in a hundred people have celiac disease. so. Um, is celiac more prevalent in autistic children? No, but one in a hundred of them do have celiac disease, just like one in a hundred of everybody else. So 
if you have celiac disease and you have some gluten, you do damage to the small intestine lining, and, and that's a bad thing. Now, if you don't have celiac disease and you just might have leaky gut or something like that, it isn't going to do maybe permanent damage, but, but it sort of irritates the situation and makes it difficult. But to me, the biggest, the biggest reason why not to do that is thinking of behavior modification. If you open this door, a light comes on. If you do this, you get hit on the head. You know that, that behavior modification model that, yeah, that you learned in, um, in, yeah, the Pavlo's response. The, you know that if you open this door and you're going to get hit on the head, sooner or later you're going to know that. And, and so that's going to become a conditioned response that is going to happen. The almost, the most difficult pattern to break is one of those that responses that varies. If 20 times you open that door and you get hit on the head, and then once you don't, and then you go back to 20, it's so confusing and it reinforces such a negative message. It's, it's hard when you say no to your child and then every now and then you say yes, and then you, because they're gonna, it's just gonna reinforce whining, negative behavior, and, and I think that it's, it's on or off. You either stay on the diet or you don't. But do you have another good. opinion to that? Um, no, that was good. Okay. Um, I hope I answer all of these because, um, Lisa, are you here? Lisa? I don't know who's, I, I figure you might be Lisa. Lisa lives in Hong Kong. Welcome. Um, how do you find the, the right quality ingredients? Well, I'll tell you what, if you bring me to Hong Kong, I'll go shopping with you <laughs> and I'll find everything that I need to find for you. Um, how is shipping to Hong Kong? Is it, is it difficult? If, if people ship things to you, is there any problem with it? Or, I mean, you usually will get it, or it's just extremely expensive to have things shipped to you? Okay. Okay. <laughs> right, right. Well, you know, there's the, the other thing, too, is that I'm not particularly proud of American food. <laughs> um, I think you're closer to a culture that understands food a heck of a lot better than we in America do. So um, I, I'm planning on going to Thailand in October, and I'm very excited about it because I think that's one country that really gets nutrition. Um, and they, uh, you know, so maybe, maybe looking to other sources, different types of foods, because it is not difficult to do GFCF in Asia because of the fact that so many things are rice-based. Um, but as far as websites, we do, there, you know, there are quite a few different websites of where you can order special foods. Um, I think both of these ladies have it in their books, but just, you know, just off the top of my head, I can tell you Allergy Grocer is a really good one. Um, you can get... Um, special foods through, I don't know, just tell me some other ones off the top of your heads. Just glutenfree.com. Glutenfree.com. Yeah, there's, there's lots of different mm -hmm. companies that, that have. I, I would think most, I know Ms. Ro um, gluten, uh, Allergy Grocer does, which is formerly Miss Robbins. I know they do. You also might, are you looking for mostly gluten and casein-free foods? Okay. So I was going to say, you, you know, you might be able to join some local support group or something that might be able to find you, yeah, yeah, like a co-op or resources that you might not know of otherwise, or a Weston A price group. Right. Well, that's probably going to be more just high quality ingredients in general versus GFCF products. And, and you know, th there's a there's a celiac website, uh, listserv, that you can join. That even though it is celiac, I would say we have a good amount of people that are also GFCF and and parents of autistic children. And what I like about this listserv is that it's international and you can post questions to it and say, you know, where can I find GFCF in whatever country, whatever city, and people always come back with great responses. I've used it to find products and, and locations all the time. And Lisa also asks about, um, do, do only Dan doctors test for IgG? Uh, IgE, any doctor will test for. Do, do only Dan doctors test for IgG? Uh, G. And I think you can find, especially in the alternative mm. field, a lot of doctors that will test for IgG. Um, there's a doctor sitting right there in the corner in a beige suit who I give you full permission to hound after this is over with. He'd be 
thrilled to answer your questions for free. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, Dan, Dr. Candid, but, but, but you know what, the, the term Dan, since we're at Autism One, I have to just mention this. The, the term Dan doctor does not mean a heck of a lot. They only have to go to one conference and they don't even have to really fill out any sort of a testing to become a quote unquote Dan doctor. And, and, and you know, some of it can be extremely cookie cutterish too. And, and I'm not saying it's bad because it's a wonderful role model, you know, there's a lot of good things that are from it. But, but you have to, you know, it's not, there, it's not the beginning and end of, of finding a good doctor that really understands the body. Because what we're here preaching today is nutrition. And nutrition is actually really overlooked by most doctors in general, except for my husband who cannot hear enough of it. Right, honey? <laughs> um, he... <laughs> He, uh, he gets hounded from it, either between Susan or I, we're, we're constantly on him, or his partner, Beth. But, but you, you can get, you, you need to have somebody that understands just the whole way that the gut and everything works. So one idea is to go to a company, a lab of a company that does IgG testing, and they sometimes have physician referrals on there as well too. Genova.com, G-E-N-O-V-A is a good company. Um, uh, SAGE, S-A-G-E, I think they're going to probably be here. They were here last year, so I don't know that they'll be here. But to find somebody then that might, might do that. Um, and then um, cooking classes available in Chicago over the summer. Susan teaches cooking classes, a lot of them, and she's in the Chicagoland area. So get, send her an email. I'm sure she'll send you a lot of good things such as that. Um, Whole Foods does have a lot of prepared foods um, while you're here. Um, so that, that that can help you as well too. But you know, I always tell people if they're looking to be eating out, to think other nationalities. Once again, you know, American food is not a food I'm proud of. It's it's just nutritionally not really the greatest food. So you need to think in terms. I, you know, I would talk about Indian food. Now, Indian food can have a lot of dairy in it, but you can sometimes request that the dairy is not added because most Indian restaurants, at least the ones that I frequently attend, they make things they make things to order. They they are not bulk making and you just get a slop of this and a slop of that. I mean, I, I love Indian restaurants because they take your order seriously in most places. And, and, and then um, any kind of an Asian restaurant, you, you can find some good. Thai is one of the best because Thai food almost exclusively uses rice noodles, not always, but they mostly use rice noodles and they practically never use dairy. It's mostly coconut milk. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's the end of anything that... I, if there's any other questions, I'm sorry, but we'll move on. Okay. okay. Our four-year-old son has cro had chronic problems with gut dysbiosis, yeast, and bacteria. He's been on a multitude of medications for his problem with little help. So our Dan doctor has recently allowed organic popcorn into his diet. He's been on SCD for a year and a, year and a half to two years now. Isn't this bad for his gut? Also, I cook with popcorn in a stainless steel pan with, co with walnut oil, and she wasn't she was a little frustrated with that, so we'll talk about that. And that tags on to another question, which is, if yeast is detected in a test, should fermented foods be eaten? So this is kind of all related. So I'd have to sort of know a little bit more on what multitude of things have been done for the yeast. Sometimes yeast, from what I understand, can be resistant to lots of medications. So sometimes there are better ways, like diet, but it sounds like you've also done diet, or at least done SCD, and that hadn't worked. So what I'll just say is, I would look at a couple things. I would look at adding fermented foods because they might really be able to help populate that good bacteria in a way that maybe something else wasn't able to do so. I would also, this is where that whole conversation of the low oxalate diet, I would bring that in here. It's a diet that is fairly new and added another level of complexity and complication in some ways. But this is kind of one of the scenarios where I might look into it. So I'd have to know a little bit more with SCD, when it, how it wasn't working. Here's what sometimes happens is when you do SCD, there's a lot of nuts and on the diet. And so nuts are high in oxalates and they can create a lot of inflammation in the gut and that inflammation can feed yeast and, and dysbiosis. And good bacteria is supposed to or can help break down those oxalates so it, it, they all could work synergistically. So a couple things, it sounds like your doctor is trying to make it less restrictive which might be a great way to go and I'm suggesting you might want to try to make it a little more restrictive and see if that helps and if that doesn't help then work backwards 
and loosen it up and see how you can see if maybe it will improve it that way. So some, something to at least consider. Can, can, I, can I just add yeah. to that too? With the yeast, so many of the doctors will put patients on Nystatin and, and Diflucan. And what people don't also know is that Nystatin and Diflucan can push the yeast into the liver, making it almost in, definitely difficult to get rid of. Um, there are a lot of great ways to kill yeast, and obviously the way you eat is one very important one of them. But one of the, another great way to kill yeast is with enzymes that actually eat away at yeast as opposed to breaking up the pockets. Because yeast, yeast lives in pockets of toxins, and when you burst them open, the toxins go throughout, and that's when you get that kind of yeast die-off end. Where when you do an enzyme to kill the yeast, it kind of gradually will eat away at it. There's also a very wonderful natural tea that will kill yeast called Indian firebark tea that is doesn't necessarily taste like a tree tastes like wood <laughs> but it, it is also very very good at killing yeast and so the thing with diflucan and nystatin is that they can they can really put some stress on your liver over time and um, you know w when you hear well, well we'll stay on that until liver enzymes are raised once liver enzymes are raised, you've already done damage. I mean, you don't want to wait for them to get raised. You want to keep the liver healthy the entire time. So, so if, you're, if you're doing a lot of meds to kill yeast, it may not be your best option. Okay, and let me just finish up that with... So the question about should I do fermented foods if I have yeast, this is a great question because it comes up a lot. One of the main diets, the, a lot of the, the basic yeast diets say avoid sugars and, and fermented foods. And we talked earlier in the first couple hours about how sugars and vinegars feed yeast. So what I've pieced together over all of this research is that the fermented vinegar foods like vinegar pickles and vinegar sauerkrauts and vinegar ketchups and things like that, those definitely can feed yeast. But typically the good lactobacillus ferments are beneficial in populating the good digestive system with all that good bacteria. And then the other yeast killing things like the Saccharomyces boulardii and the kombucha and those sorts of things, those also often help to kill yeast. So those might be good options for people with yeast and bacteria. I think those are great options for yeast and bacteria and I would consider the fermented foods two different classes of fermented foods and it's created a lot of confusion but I think that for most people the fermented foods are very helpful. Now there are some instances and not to add more confusion, I'll just in Chinese medicine, for example, the condition of, of candida, I believe, is damp and, mm -hmm. and something else. And so cold, raw, fermented foods, which they are, can feed that damp condition and, make, can, in, and, and not be particularly helpful. So you have to kind of see where you're starting from. What I'll often do is add a little bit of spiciness to the fermented food if that is a condition. So a little ginger to the sauerkraut, a little cayenne if they like spicy, a little... Uh, cinnamon if they don't have a phenol issue, something warming to help balance the energetic properties of the fermented foods. So, you know, there's no across the board, something is great or terrible for everyone, but uh, some shades of gray. And then the last piece on the walnut oil, you, you really want to uh, save the, those types of delicate oils for no heat cooking and do something more like salad dressings or yes for salad dressing great and instead use something else like the expeller pressed coconut or something that works well like grapeseed oil for the high heat uh, uh, popcorn popping I agree okay corn <laughs> what about organic corn on the cob do you have the same concerns um, I eat organic corn on the cob from time to time Part of the corn issue that we talk about, there's, there's more than one, one piece to look at. Corn, if you're talking about corn chips or corn starch or corn flour, is from this dried corn that gets mold on it, that's stored in these big bins and then it goes through some machinery to, um, to grind it and process it. And that is more problematic. Uh, fresh corn on the cob, organic, I. I don't think it's a problem all the time. Right. It is high on the glycemic index, so it's got a lot of sugar in it, and it does, that sugar turns to starch in your body pretty quickly. But I don't think that there's a problem with organic corn on the cob as long as it isn't your everyday diet. I agree. So my son smells everything. How do I combat what he smells? And this is an important question because 
with, with the way that things smell, um, you have to take a look at the sensory integration piece. Because if, if they're having a problem with senses, then the smell part is an indicator that there's something going on sensory-wise. And that's where heavy metals can play a part of it. You have to really heal the body to get rid of the smell part. Um, the other one is about pasteurized milk. So you're from Ohio. And with, in, o in Ohio, it's, a, it's illegal. And it is also illegal in Wisconsin and some other states. I think it's For raw, you mean? I think you said raw. pasteurized. Raw. I'm sorry. Sorry. Pasteurized milk is illegal in Ohio. It's also illegal in Wisconsin. Raw. Raw. You said pasteurized. You said pasteurized. Sorry. <laughs> raw milk. I, I, what, what, is, it in, is it in Illinois? I don't know. I, I think it's I think it's legal in, in Illinois. But how they how we do it in Wisconsin is we buy a share of the cow. Um, so you find a farm and you can you can buy what's called a share. So then you're a part owner of it, and then you can buy the milk back from that. So you can do it that way. And then um, the the question of you know are you gonna are you gonna kill your body by if you occasionally, if you eat really healthy and then once a week go out for a Big Mac. Well, I can tell you from experience that if you are really eating extremely healthy, you will not want to go out once a week for a Big Mac because you aren't going to feel well. And, and I know his question of, you know, is, is then, is, uh, you know, so we live shorter, but I want to live. I want to I be able to have, have a good life and live. And that is totally your choice. We're definitely not questioning. If, if you feel that not eating you know, good f food and, and is just like, you know, I just don't want to eat this kind of food, that's OK. It really is. Um, it's your choice. And yeah, you are going to compromise your health, but it's also your choice also. So we're just telling you ways to make yourself be healthier. OK. Is there a, this is a web question. Is there a book that combines GFCF and Feingold? I would say I don't know of a book. I would give a, provide a couple resources. My website actually has a recipe application that I create, or a program that I created that you can go in there and you can say, I want a diet that's GFCF, phenol, low phenols, and egg free. And it will generate all the recipes that are in there that have those, mm. those properties. So that's one place that you can go. It's, it's, sort of, it's on the smaller side right now, so please, if you have any recipes you want to contribute, that'd be great. But that's one place. And then I would say this is, this is a great place to look at a nutrition consultant. This is probably the primary thing I do in my practice because you know, if you, you can go and you can find GFCF or some of those things. There's tons of books. But then when you start to have to combine multiple diets into one, it gets a little complicated quickly. And then you have to figure out, do I, do I need to do all the principles 100%? Or, so for GFCF, you have to do all the principles for 100%. 100%. Fine goal, there's some gray area. And so it's, to, ma um, to marry the two together, it's often helpful to get some help on how to do that in the most effective way with the most options available. Uh, so I don't know of a particular book, although, I mean, my book certainly has a lot on Feingold diet. It has a lot on GFCF diet. If you want a specific plan for your child all put together in one, then you probably want to go to someone that can customize something for you. What's your website? Uh, I have two. So the website for my book and all my resources is nourishinghope.com. And that will take you to my other website that has the recipe manager and everything like that on there. And there's actually some great, I'd love to get your experience. It's a website and a blog. So the blog has all the sorts of information on other parent experience. So if you've tried raw dairy or you've tried SCD or you've had some good experiences, I'd love to get as much response so that other parents such as yourself can start to see, oh, I was really nervous about that raw dairy thing, but I'm hearing some really good advice. And so there's uh, some interactive piece to it as well. So. What is a good pizza crust? And I'm assuming a GFCF pizza crust. Um, and, and we have some different ideas about this. We've <laughs> been talking about it. We fought over who got to answer this. And uh, I, I like the, if you want a pre-made pizza crust, there's a Kniknik makes, I think, a really good one. And, um, and I can't spell it for you, but I'll be K-I-N-N-I-K-I-N-N-I-C-K. They have a website, and you can go to their website, and they'll tell you where stores are in your area that sell them, or you can buy them on the internet. Their website's go gluten free. It's knickknick.com. <laughs> yeah, it's that too, but go, you can also do go gluten free. Okay. So the pizza crust issue, um, the the knickknick is a little sweet, and when I first tried that, it was like, but this isn't what I wanted, you know. Um, there are other 
pizza crusts that are good. And, and I, this sort of piggybacks into a bread that I like. There's a, a bread mix made by Pamela's. This might be the only Pamela's thing that I, that I recommend, because a lot of Pamela's has, has corn, a lot of Pamela's has dairy. But she makes a bread mix that's Pamela's Amazing Wheat-Free Bread Mix that happens to be gluten-free and dairy-free and corn-free and soy-free. And, and it's the least expensive mix that I've ever tried. You can actually get it at Amazon.com. If you get it at Amazon.com, if you buy six of them, it's 20 bucks, but you pay shipping. If you buy 12, it's $40 and no shipping, so it's $3.33 for a bag. It makes a very good bread that actually, it, as you, many of you know, I can't talk holding on to things. I got to free up my hands here. Many of you know that the gluten-free breads are like batters, so you can't do anything with them. But the Pamela's mix is thicker. You can actually mold it into a free-form loaf. You can make hamburger buns with it. You can also roll it out to make a pizza crust. There's recipes on the side. If anybody is interested, I typed up a whole page of alternatives that you can do with this mix. Um, you can make it egg-free, and it still tastes good. I use flavored oils. I add herbs to it. I do a lot of things to make it taste good. Um, so that is one of my choices. And then also for pizza crust. Also on the same question was lunch and snack suggestions. And, and I know Betsy wanted to answer this one no, too, so I will, I will just give you my thoughts. And <laughs> we're you down can... to 25 minutes, just want you all to know that. Okay, so. we're good. Okay. Um, I, for lunch, whatever I have for dinner, I would also eat yeah. for lunch. I love to have leftovers and, and pack that up for, for my lunch. Um, I'm a big salad eater, so for me that's, that's good, but I know that all kids don't like things like that. The other thing that, that I like is um, sweet potatoes. When I have sweet potatoes for dinner, I make extra ones and I stuff them with things. Sweet potatoes are great stuffed with a variety of vegetables. Um, there's a, a turkey ham that doesn't have bad additives that's good chopped up in there. Walnuts is good, broccoli is good. So stuffed sweet potatoes travels well. Um, Chicken salads, turkey salads. And I know you're thinking of your kids and, and how, well, what, what am I going to, you know, they get made fun of. And I know this. And it's very interesting because of my three children. You know, one doesn't care. He's not socially, he socially just doesn't care what he's eating. But, an, but another one was, it's very interesting. She was really teased for her lunches up until middle school. And then she hit seventh grade in middle school. And then all of a sudden, everybody coveted her homemade food. <laughs> it was like up to a certain age, it was gross and weird and strange. And then all of a sudden it was like, wow, your mom cooks? And, and it became really cool. So um, it really dep it depends on the peer pressure. If you are dealing with peer pressure, you can do very sneaky things like buy Lunchables, dump it out, give it to the neighbor, whatever, and then use the box and put your own crackers and your own nitrate-free meat in there and your own, you know, whatever juice can, can not concoct, you can do some any of these wonderful, this tea that we have, put that inside there, anything like that. And so you can make your own, like, Lunchable type things to make it look like other kids' lunch. And then you've got something like these buns that we just, I'm so, we just discovered, the, I mean, just brand new company. And it's like you can make a sandwich look just better than anybody just like else's. everybody else's. Yeah. But yeah, just uh, you can use those wraps that we made to make sal to make a sandwich to roll something up in there. You can make a GFCF crepe and roll it up into lunch type things, whatever you'd put in a sandwich. So th there's a lot of options. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay, so why, why do you like cast iron pans instead of stainless steel? Because of the non-stick. Um, stainless steel, will, uh, will ha things will stick to it more. With cast iron, the more you cook on it, the more seasoned it gets, just like, just like stoneware. And it will build up. What happens, it has pores. Cast iron has pores just like um, uh, stoneware does. And eventually, the pores get nice and coated with a, that, so it keeps things from sticking to it. With cast iron, and I meant to say this earlier, especially with the tortillas, you always want to get it hot before you add the oil. So what you do is when you get it hot, it opens up the pores, then you put the oil on it, and then start cooking from there. Wait, that's the same for stainless steel. You want to do the same thing with stainless steel. You want to, you want to get it hot first, then put the oil on, and, and a good stainless steel pan, like an all-clad, won't right. stick. I, I agree with Betsy that I think both of them are good. Stainless steel, what you just want to avoid are the cheap aluminum pans. Right. 
and the, the Teflon coated pans. So you get a good stainless steel pan that's got some weight to it or a good cast iron. I think the reason that, that one of the reasons that we recommend cast iron over stainless steel sometimes is it's not as expensive. You can afford to have two or three of these great cast iron skillets for one $200 all clad pan. Do one of you have the questions that so they were concerned about heavy metals in the, in the um, cast iron. The only metal that will, or the only mineral that will come out will be potentially iron. And it is not, a, other than adult men who may have an excessive amount of iron, very few women are deficient in iron and children usually are not deficient. Or, Excuse me, I'm just not getting my words together here. <laughs> Very few people are to have too much iron. Deficiency is more likely in women and in children. Um, men technically have too, too much. So cast iron does tend to work well for all types. And even most men these days, unless they're eating just large, large amounts of meat, probably um, don't have an excessive. But men in too much iron can be a problem with, the, with hormonal. What about butter? What kinds? What, what, what's okay and what's not? And then there's a couple other questions here. So firstly, if you're truly casein sensitive, you can't do any butter. If you wanted, instead you could do ghee that we talked about earlier, that was casein free. Although some people can handle a little bit of raw butter, especially as the gut heals, that's usually the best tolerated of the butters if you're going to do butter and want to get the good properties of that. So if raw dairy is available in your state and you got the gut on its way and you want a little bit of that, that would probably be my best option. But on a true gluten and casein-free diet, you wouldn't be doing any butter directly. And then uh, I'm a little confused on how you make your own yogurt. So let me just describe whether you use almond milk, raw dairy, pasteurized dairy, there's a little bit of heating, things that are slightly different, but basically you want to you want to warm it, put the good bacteria starter in there, keep it somewhere warm for 24 hours, and you've got your yogurt in whatever form it happens to be. And you want to warm it typically in a yogurt maker. That's the most simple thing. Um, I, told, I said I use a dehydrator, but not to complicate matters. If all you want to make is yogurt, then you could just use a yogurt maker. And it's, again, nut milk would be the best in terms of being 100% gluten and casein free. If you're SCD compliant and you don't have to avoid casein, and on top of that you don't have to avoid casein, you could do a pasteurized and make your own, or you, you could use a pasteurized milk and make your own yogurt, or you could use a raw dairy and make your own yogurt, depending. And then and you add your sweetener after. You, you uh, maybe, maybe. No, no, you add the sweetener before. I think that, I don't know if they, oh, they want to Okay, know so that. for milk you don't have to add a sweetener, but yes, for, sorry, for the nut milk you okay. want to add a little bit of sweetener. Okay. Thank you. And, and if you aren't dairy intolerant and you wanted to have butter, the best would be an organic, right? Thank you. Well, yeah, when I think of most raw butter, anybody that's going to be doing that more sure. or less is going to be having an organic <laughs> you can tell raw. We're all getting tired. <laughs> and then the last piece of this is, can you explain why regular sugar is bad? I know it is, but what's the reasoning? Well, there's, a, there's several things in there. One is the process of bleaching it and all the chemicals and things that are added in the process. The other is that all the good minerals that would help to some extent process that sugar and, and, and help your body utilize it properly are stripped away. And so you have all of the negative without the benefit. And so it's going to require your good minerals to help process it, which are most likely in short supply for many kids on the spectrum. Um, it's not good for the immune system. It will depress the immune system for quite a few hours. So if you're doing it regularly, it's, it's difficult on the immune system. Anything it else? It will you raise your cholesterol. Which I always thought was immune system. You said that, yeah. Pardon yeah. me. No, you're right. Yeah, raise your yeah, cholesterol. It will yeah. raise your it will raise your cholesterol. There's so many things about sugar that are problematic. Um, can have problems with your sleep, disrupt your sleep patterns, and of course there's that weight issue that we don't want to forget about. <laughs> and um, of course the pancreas and all of that. Uh, exactly. The pancreas. The pancreas and the insulin is is very very important. Um, and I just want to piggyback because my question, my, okay. my can I, question can I is about sugar. About yes. Question? Okay, so in terms of the sugar, it's also one of the things is that when we're using these natural sugars or these more whole sugars like we talked about earlier, they're still going to feed yeast. They're still not great for the pancreas. They're still not great for the immune system. So, but they have some minerals to make them a little better. And if we're using small amounts in moderation, that's a good sugar to go with. Also, white, stripped white sugar is sugar cane, and sugar cane tends to be one of the top 
10 most common allergens, whereas these other sugars aren't. So they all have sugar, and all sugar acts similarly in the body, but there are those other properties to the other sugars used in small amounts, which for some people are, are much better. Right. And my question was very similar about substitutes for sugar, and could they use organic sugar? And, and I think that we talked about this a little bit this morning. My first choice for a sugar substitute is usually agave. Because it's a low glycemic, it's not going to spike your blood sugar, so it's a little more friendly to your pancreas. Um, but it's still sugar, and, and it isn't wonderful. Then moving down the line with agave being first, then I might say tapioca syrup and rice syrup and, and maple syrup, those three again have some health properties because they have some enzymes and some minerals and some good things, but they are still sugar, so in moderation using them. Honey, again, is, is high on the glycemic index, and although it's natural and it has some good properties, it isn't good for everyone, and if, you know, so we use that in limited amounts. And, and then finally, the stevia is one that, that I don't recommend using too much of, but a, a little bit goes a long way. It, it, to me, has an aftertaste and it doesn't cook well. But if you wanted to sprinkle a little bit, because the examples on mine were on cereal, on strawberries, on my cucumber salad recipe, um, agave, agave, and stop eating cereal. <laughs> yeah. Um, Can I add a little to that? Yes. <laughs> So the nice thing about stevia is it doesn't feed yeast, so if you did want a little bit and you had a challenge with that, it would provide you some options that would be beneficial, although stevia is not allowed on SCD, so again, depending on what diet. And then I'd love to piggyback my question, because it's an agave question, onto okay. that, and then we'll go to... Agave syrup is high fructose. How does it differ from high fructose corn syrup? Great question. Agave syrup is high in fructose. It's mainly fructose and sugar, but high fructose corn syrup is a different process of taking regular corn syrup and processing it through high heat and smoking it and bleaching it and deodorizing it and doing all these things to it, creating this high fructose corn syrup, which spikes blood sugar really rapidly. So agave is high in fructose. High fructose corn syrup is a different thing and much, much more problematic. Good answer. I, I love is, having her in our team. You. Can, can I just finish my, my question here? Um, also from the same, the same person said, the coconut energy balls had what kind of zest and how much? We didn't put the zest in, but you could use lemon or orange zest in them. And, and the quantity was, it wasn't written I, I, in the recipe? I don't remember. I've made it, I usually use, I think, like a teaspoon or something like that. I avoided it just in case someone had citrus allergies. Uh, it's pretty, it's, it's good. It's nice to add in there. It's a little, yeah. and it, you can just go, ba I used to go based on taste. Okay, and then I have to just, because I always feel guilty when I come down on people about saying things like stop eating cereal, they might be having a great bowl of quinoa and millet warm cereal and and if that's the case, if you're having gluten-free oats, or, or gluten-free, oh, yeah, gluten-free, certified gluten-free oats, or things like that, if you're having something like that, a little maple syrup or a little agave would be wonderful. Just no gorilla munch. <laughs> I think we've made that very clear for you. It's, it's, <laughs> it's the one thing you're going to walk away from. It's that puffing process of the grains that is problematic. It really raises blood sugar and it creates some toxic compounds in that pro processing. So it's those puffed O's and things that right. are the problem, but homemade organic granolas or warm cereals sure. don't have those same, uh, it's not the same process. And the grains don't, or, because these grains in these cereals, they go in vats that just sit for large, large periods of time and they mold over time as well too. Um, is organic ketchup okay? You know, I, I like this question because of the fact that um, and I don't blame you for asking because it's kind of like, you know, what are the lessers of the evils? You know, it's, it's just, you know, so yes, it's, it's better to do organic ketchup than Heinz. And then yes, it's even better to do like West Bray that doesn't use sugar, they use fruit, uh, fruit juice as a sweetener. So there, there's different levels of it. Is it okay? Don't know. Don't know your child, don't know your situation, and, I'm, and I, can't, I can't tell you. I think that's one thing that you've learned from today. There is no one size fits all other than don't eat Gorilla Munch. Um, frozen fruit. Or Skittles. Or Skittles. <laughs> or Fruity Pebbles. Um, frozen fruits and vegetables to puree 
I think that's what it's veggie puree to use. I think, okay, we talked about the frozen fruits and vegetables. I think, I don't, actually I was, I'm not sure if it was that you wanted to know if it's okay to use the frozen fruits and vegetables. Yes, we already kind of talked about that and using them organic. I was, at first I was thinking it was pureed um, because I am big in, dis, in sneaking in foods to puree things into foods. If you have a pr problem getting the child eating uh, meats or vegetables, to pure, even using baby foods to puree them and to put them into pancake Pancakes. recipes and muffin recipes and things like that, you can get some great nutrition that way. Um, can you grind your own nut flax? Um, I, I'm just, I don't know if you're just meaning grind your own nuts or grind your own flax. If you grind your own flax, yes, you can grind your flax, but if you grind your flax, you need to ref preferably refrigerate or, or, or freeze it right away. Freezing would probably be even better to make sure it doesn't continue to, to go on and, and oxidize. And oxidize. Thank you. Um, and then lastly, does Whole Foods have a website? Yes. Guess what? It's wholefoods.com. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All of my three boys are on the spectrum and have severe nut allergies. Then two have allergies to corn, peanuts, buckwheat, and eggs, etc. How do I transition to SCD? So if they are allergic to nuts but not coconut, you can use coconut and make coconut flour and use that in some of the recipes and make macaroons and various recipes from that. If they're sensitive to coconut as one of the nuts, then this is one of the things that makes SCD challenging. However, if you don't have a picky eater, then you can certainly do a diet of meat, vegetables, some fruits, and you could do that. If, you don't, if they don't do vegetables, you're going to have a hard time because you can't live on meat alone and you need those good mm -hmm. minerals to balance out the meat and everything. So it, it can be done if you, have, if you don't have a picky eater, but if you have a really picky eater, it's a little bit challenging. And so then I might look at, is there a better diet that might work better for you rather than SCD that, that might uh, fit your needs a little more? I have a question. What is the best cooking, spray oil for cooking? And, and I don't think that there is one on the market. Um, what I would recommend, instead of getting one of those spray oils that have alcohol and, and all kinds of things added to them, you can buy at a kitchen store a bottle that you can make your own. You put your own spray in there and you squirt that on, and that's a lot better. You control what goes in. You control the whole process of that. So that would be my recommendation, is go to the cooking store and buy your own applicator and fill it. It does get rancid, so it's not something that you can fill up with oil and then not look at it again for six months or a year. You know, don't fill it all the way. Fill it up a little bit because because the oil will spoil and or keep it refrigerated. Um, how often should IgG, IgE tests be uh, repeated? IgE does not need to be repeated very often at all because it's like we talked about earlier, it's more innate, something that was going to be around for a while. IgG, depending on what you're doing, if you're not doing much of anything differently than you were doing a year ago, then you don't need to really repeat it. But if you've been doing a lot to rotate your foods, if you've been working on helping the immune system, if you've been trying to eliminate leaky gut, then I would say do it once a year because you will th see things come down over time. And then cookware is 18 over 10 uh, uh, surgical stainless steel okay? Yes. Okay. I have two left, so I might just do both of them. Okay. And I'm having a hard time finding palm oil. So I have a little grocer in San Francisco that ha sells red palm oil, but not the regular palm oil. And so I don't know if either of you Tropical have a good traditions. online. Tropical Traditions sells palm oil. And they sell the red palm oil as well. Okay, mm -hmm. great. And then the other, and red palm oil is particularly high in vitamin A and some of the good vitamin E, beta carotene type stuff. And then the second one is, does miso or wheat-free soy sauce promote yeast or fungus growth? And then what is a yeast-free diet? So I would say yes, for this, I would consider some of these the fermented you know, this, this is one of those difficult questions that I'd put these kind of on the board, especially miso. I mean, it's fermented, and I suppose it has some good properties if you do soy. I, I don't do any soy, so I, don't, I, I personally don't. Um, and I'm not really a big fan, so if you can avoid soy altogether, I think that would be best. But if for whatever reason I'm you're having a little bit of this in your diet, I suppose it would be depend on the amount. I'd say it's probably not great. Yes, it would probably feed yeast to some extent. So if you can avoid it, that's better. And then what does a yeast-free diet look like? 
So a standard yeast-free diet that's not a special like specific carbohydrate diet or some elaborate plan, a standard yeast-free diet is no sugars and low refined carbohydrates and then low vinegar foods. So it's going to be none of the vinegars we talked about, um, no fruits, no fruit juices, or, or very low fruit or only sour fruits. So it depends. And maybe you just keep fruit low for or no fruit for a month and then slowly introduce some of the more sour fruits and do some of those. But a strict, strict yeast diet would be no fruit, no fruit juices. I would definitely say no juices, but the fruits, you may have to be a, lean, a little lenient depending on what's going on and how bad the yeast is and where you are in the process. Six months later, you don't have to be doing no fruit at all, but at the beginning, it's often helpful. And then avoid a lot of highly refined carbohydrates, flour products, crackers and chips and breads, oh, yeast, so yeast breads, so breads made with, um, you know, a baker's yeast, I'd avoid those as well. That's, that's what I would say, unless any of you had anything to add. That's great. I agree. I, I just have uh, one question. Um, what GFCF cookbook can you recommend? And, and, and I have written a GFCF cookbook, and I, and I, I know you're all thinking, oh, you're going to recommend your own, which I am. But, <laughs> but um, special eats, uh, gluten and dairy-free cooking. It's and, my favorite, and I didn't write it. And, but, but there's other great GFCF cookbooks, and certainly mine is not the only one. Um, I think it's Annalise Roberts has a, no, it's not casein free, never mind. Carol Fenster mm -hmm. has some very good cookbooks. She's one of my favorites. My cookbook is not a baking book. It's a breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I have a few cookies and snacks that I think are, are very good, but for the most part, it's, it's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Carol Fenster does more cookies and breads and things like that, and she has, her latest cook is called Cooking Free, and it's gluten-free, and it has options for dairy-free, sugar-free, and egg-free. She does use a lot of soy, so you have to be careful, and because I would not recommend adding the soy. But her books are very good in that she gives a lot of great um, descriptions of all the different gluten-free flours, how to use them, which ones have particular properties. I think she does a very good job of that. But as far as, to me, I use all kinds of cookbooks. I have, yeah. I have probably 500 cookbooks. I love raw food cookbooks. I love vegan cookbooks. And, and I'm not a vegan, but there's good things about all of those cookbooks, particularly it's inspiration. I subscribe to every cooking magazine, and I know I'm a little over the top, okay? But I read them because I'm inspired, and I think many things are naturally gluten and casein free. If they're not, they're simple things that could be adapted. I just want to read a new idea, something that's going to yeah. taste good. The reason that you come here is for inspiration, and reading cookbooks don't be discouraged if you read a cookbook and it's got gluten and dairy in it. Just think about how could you turn that around. Just be inspired by them. That's great advice. Um, any recommendations for GFC of ranch salad dressing? That almond yogurt that they made earlier, mm -hmm. I think, would be a great way to add dairy to a salad dressing. Um, and then lastly, which is a great question to kind of end on, what are some suggestions for edible reinforcers that are GFCF? Our son loves reinforcers like jelly beans as a reward reinforcer during his therapy. Well, I don't think you have to wonder much that I'm going to say not to give him jelly beans, even if they are gluten and casein free. But let me just to explain why. I recently, in March, actually decided to give up sugar. Now, I have not given up, I mean white cane sugar, I just decided to give it up. And um, I, the reason I want to explain this story to you is because my entire taste buds have completely changed in the last three months. I mean, I can't even believe things that I now like that I um, used to think were gross and things that I used to love, like sweet wines and things like that, that now just repulse me. The, the point of it is, is that your taste buds will change. And although it's really hard to think of a child's life without a lot of candy in it, as you start taking these things away and these sugars away, Things like a little piece of apple slice or a little piece of a, of, a, of a berry, a blueberry, can be a wonderful treat. They make those just fruits. Have you seen those before? They're dehydrated fruits. Those can be a wonderful candy option for a child. Um, and then 
you know, reinforcers, if you're doing ABA, it doesn't have to always be, a good ABA therapist doesn't have to have food as a constant reinforcer. They can do praise, they can do other things other than just food all of the time. Um, I am definitely not going to recommend a candy to be constantly be given over and over as a reinforcer. I think it really takes away from all, the, all of what we've been trying to teach today. But you can make other good foods. Terra chips, somebody talked about Terra chips recently. You know, it's the beet and the parsnip and the those all those Tomatoes. you could you could potato yeah and all those great types of chips those could be great reinforcers as well so just just to keep the sugar down to a low would be great and Please. and the uh, the date balls that yes. that um, yes. Julie made today would be a great reinforcer when you when you said uh, the dried and dehydrated fruits when, you know I think about those blueberries that are in that trail mix or the the granola mix oh those are fabulous you know they're really wonderful and that is very sweet and um, it is high in sugar, natural sugar, but I think that would be a lot better alternative. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to everybody who watched so us over Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.